So welcome to this this morning to this series leading up to the big Resurrection Sunday in, in Easter and we're calling it Alive in Christ for what I hope are obvious reasons. Now we're only going to take a few verses at a time uh, as we go through this and because uh, I really want us to get get into the really good stuff in this passage which the whole passage that I'll be preaching from is Colossians 3, 6 to 15. Um, I had the intro, intro part read as well, just to give some context. But um, So I'll be looking at 6 to 15 over the next three sermons for the simple reason that there's just loads of incredibly good wisdom crammed in there. And through it all is that fundamental truth of the resurrection of Jesus, and that's the end of that section is focuses on the resurrection, so which fits in nicely with how we kind of time it. But rest assured, it's not just dry theology, not by a long shot. This is a great help to our Christian lives, and it's and to know what it means to be alive in Christ is, is just practical help in our Christian lives. And particularly today's section, which is called Walking in Him, well, that's what I've called it anyway, that's what we're going to be focusing on today, our walk, because biblically our walk is is often what's used to illustrate our Christian living, all the decisions we make and the things we do. So is it the road we're on, spiritually speaking, that's our walk. Because in Jesus' day, obviously, if you're going somewhere, most of the time you're on foot, right? So that's just how it was in those days. So in the same way, if you're going somewhere spiritually, or at least if we, we should be going somewhere spiritually, so assuming you are, that's your Christian walk. So how's your walk right now? How's it going? It's the question we often ask us, need to ask ourselves. So are you pretty much on track? Or are you going okay but just a bit worried about what's over the next hill? That's going to be quite fair enough in some ways. Or are you wandering all over the road a bit? Or are there some potholes you've got to watch out for? Or have you got a bit of a limp perhaps? And you just feel like you're not really walking. There's something holding you back. Or have you fallen right off in the ditch? I hope that's not the case, but there's something for everyone here, though. So for, that's because all those possibilities are, are there for the believer, someone who is alive in Christ. So it's good to be able to know what to do for all those kind of situations we, that we can, for whatever reason, find ourselves in. So my prayer is that this encouragement from Paul to the Colossians will be an encouragement for all of us too. That's, that's what he was intending to do, a bit of an encouragement, a bit of a rev up. So there's a bit of everything there, so... Now, Paul starts out this second chapter by telling, telling them, them, the Colossians, how he, he was pleased to hear that they were well organized and firm in the faith. And that's why I got Glynis to read that, because you, you just saw that bit. But with that said, he could see some threats from false teachers that were starting to come through, which could easily damage their good foundation. So he starts to address that in verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So remember what I said about the idea of walking, right? So that's, that's the bit of our spiritual salvation that we're in now. Our growth in faith, our growth in faith in Christ specifically um, during this era of history, the church age. So Paul picks up on a pattern that's already somehow been in their lives and shows that they need to keep going according to that pattern still. So what pattern do you mean, Dave? Or Paul, actually. That's what Paul says. Whatever that pattern is originally, you keep doing it. So what's the pattern? Well, notice how he starts out. As you received Christ Jesus as Lord. Okay, so how do you receive Christ Jesus as Lord? By faith, yes. By faith. And the famous passage for that is Ephesians 2. Verses 8 and 9, if you're quick, you can probably flick there. But In fact, if you do, you can put a marker there because we'll be referring to this a few times through today. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So basically, it's not about anything you do. That's not how you get justified before God. That's the point here about being justified before God. You don't do it by works. Otherwise, it's not a gift. And you would have earned it, right? That's, you know, you've earned, you earn, earn your pay, but you don't earn a gift. 
So it's purely because of his grace toward us that he's done everything necessary for us to know him. So he sent his son to die in our place so that sin is not an obstacle anymore and he offers his spirit to guide us. So we've been taken care of, haven't we, in him. So no one can brag about how they save themselves because there's only one way, by faith, and it's the great leveller, right? It's whether you believe. Because a person of true faith recognises his or her own sinfulness and utter inability to pull themselves out of the mess they're in. We just, it's not that we don't want to, it's just that we can't because we're not capable. So we just, in faith, stick up our hand and say, yes, Lord, I accept your offer of rescue. Right? So that's, that's in the beginning. That's the first phase of our salvation, that point where we say, we, I can't do it. I confess and Christ, you are the Lord of my life. So that's the beginning of our walk with God and it's in, that's entirely by faith. So what Paul's doing here is he's saying, you know how you get converted by simply having faith? Well, that's the basis of the next phase as well. As you receive Christ, in other words, in the same way or by the same means as you first received him, that's also how you live in him, by faith. And one illustration is kind of like when, when Peter walked on the water. Okay, So think of that one. So in the first place, it took faith to step out of the boat, didn't it? It would take a lot of faith to step out of the boat in obedience to Jesus. But it also took faith to keep walking on the water, didn't it? And we can see that proof because once he started to lose his focus, he started to sink. So you need faith to get in and you need faith to keep going. So yes, you do good deeds in your spiritual walk, but the only good deeds that are of spiritual significance are those that are done as an outworking of your faith in God. So without that, you start to sink. You and I, I'm not saying you, (laughs) all of us, we're all in the same boat, so to speak. Sorry, bad joke there. Wasn't he meant to be a joke? Anyway, moving on. Now remember, faith in God does not, it's not some kind of spiritual tank, okay? So just, just, I'll have a few pictures here today, hopefully trying to explain things. So it's not a spiritual tank that you have to increase the fullness of by doing good things. As we just said, doing good things doesn't increase your faith. You can gain faith through doing things, but they're not the reason you, you don't gain faith by doing that. Or just as bad, you don't try and work it up in yourself like New Ages do. It's not something you just, if you just keep thinking hard enough and keep thinking happy thoughts, you'll, um, you'll have faith and God will do something for you. But that's what many think. They blindly think that if you say the right things, if you think the right thoughts, this mythical substance called faith will magically trickle into them like a tank and until they have enough to demand a response from a higher power, whatever their higher power they think it is, so that's, that's a new agey idea and there are far too many and I'll be frank, especially from Pentecostal backgrounds who think like this. Okay. True faith, though, must be in a reliable object and your faith is only as good as the object you've put it in. Right? So you can sit in a chair, but if it collapses, your faith was misplaced. So it's only as good as the chair. So true faith is built up bit by bit as God, the perfect object of faith, reveals himself to you and you say, hey, if I can trust him in this smaller thing, then I'm pretty sure I can trust him in this bigger thing and bigger thing and and so on in your life. That's how faith grows. So the things get bigger and bigger in life as you grow in faith in God because you see that he's utterly reliable and so eventually, hopefully, you put your entire weight on him. Because you sort of like put a toe and then a foot and then, you know. So you put your full weight on him. So you're standing on God in the end. All the way, but ultimately, but in your heart and in your mind, your faith is greater. So here's a little illustration as an example. During the days of the Blitz, so that's in England during World War II, the big Blitz they had there, attacked by Germany. A father holding his small son by the hand ran from a building that had been struck by a bomb. In the front yard was a shell hole 
Seeking shelter as quickly as possible, the father jumped into the hole and held up his arms for his son to follow. Terrified, with nothing but smoke all around him, yet hearing his father's voice telling him to jump, the boy said, boy replied, I can't see you. The father, looking up against the sky tinted red by the burning buildings, called to the silhouette of his son, but I can see you. Jump. The boy jumped because he trusted his father. Okay, so did the boy have blind faith? Well, well, he was kind of blinded in a sense that he couldn't, he couldn't see the object of his faith directly. So what made him jump? So it wasn't blind faith, no, or, nor was it wishful thinking. It was his personal knowledge of that object, his father, already ahead of him, right? He could trust him. He knew he could trust him. So in the same way, when we have decisions to make in life, like whether to follow Jesus or the crowd, that's a very general one, or maybe some more specific ones, should we stick to our commitment, be it marriage or whatever it is, or perhaps where do we spend our money, or responding to the call of God in some area of our lives. You know? So with these kinds of decisions that we sort of sometimes be a bit, a bit smoky situation, the question is, are we going to make that decision by faith in God or by faith in something else? Or to put it another way, will your decision reveal your love for God or your love for the world? And that's, sort of, <laughs> that's what it comes down to in the end. And yes, we will mess up sometimes, but forgiveness is always there, right? Restoration. And we do get better at it the more times we try because our foundation gets our, our foundation gets better over time. Not that God gets better over time, but our faith, foundation of our faith gets better over time. As verse 6 back in Colossians, 3, uh, Colossians sorry, 2 describes, Paul just said, So walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. So it's into verse 7. So there's a bit of a mixture of metaphors there. Being rooted in something implies like a tree or you know, a bush or whatever in, in the garden or in the, wherever. But being built up implies a building, doesn't it, to be built up. And the thing is, both symbols of God's work uh, can be symbols of God's work in people, can't they? Sort of a tree and a building. So let's look at the tree first. And for this, I'll fall back on my old favourite diagram. This one out of Growth Works, um, the, the course we went through a few years back. And I keep picking it because I think it just summarises it really well. So in that course, it described that the purpose for our life is to produce fruit for God, which can be seen in two main ways. So godly choices and Christ-like character. Okay, so the, the decisions you make in life, that's one way to tell, and also what's your character, you know, things in your heart what, when they come out. But as John North, who made the course, was quick to point out, you can't just get these things by simply by trying harder. He had the idea of like, well, if, you're an orange, if you're a tree, you can't just force out the fruit. You know, It has to happen naturally. And he says they come from having kingdom values, or in other words, priorities and goals that correspond with God's priorities and goals, so they match up with God's. Okay, so how do you get those? Well, as you trace the source further back, you see that your values come from what you set your mind on. And what you set your mind on and your heart on is, of course, the main issue. Okay, What are you setting your heart and mind on? So when you work it right back to the fundamental thing, it shows that the soil which feeds the tree is our relationship with God. And for those who have got the sheets there, I just, it's not the same tree, but if you want to fill in all the numbers, the words you can. Um, it's just I wanted a nice outline of a tree. It's a bit easier to write on. That's the idea. So yeah, our relationship with God is there. Is the, is the soil, which is on the bedrock of Christ himself, right? That's, he holds the whole thing together. And the relationship with God functions through what he calls the means of grace, which are just the practical things you do, like Bible study, prayer, meeting together with other Christians and, and all those kinds of things, which help you to know God better. So how do we produce the kind of fruit God wants from us? Ultimately, it's a relational thing, isn't it? All that stuff is, is a relational stuff. So by that relationship with Jesus and the spiritual nourishment that naturally flows up through us to the fruit, so it goes into ripening and, and producing that fruit. 
But all that is really just to say that we need to have those roots deep down into that soil, into that relationship with God. That's where it all comes from. It's that intimacy of the being right with, with Christ like that. That's ultimately what Paul's talking about by the idea of having these roots. Okay, so that's the idea of, of the tree. Now there's the idea of being built up like a building. And the best building analogy in Paul's writings comes from Ephesians 2, I think. And we'll pick that up from verse 19. So if you, that's why I said Ephesians 2. We're, we're sort of just a bit on from where we were before. Verse 21. Oh, sorry, um, from 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So starting from the first principles, right? Jesus is that first rock, the first stone that gets put in place. Because when you're building with stone, right, if your first one's not quite in the right place, if you've put it a bit out of the wrong, the right place, or it's not quite square, you know, if it's in something's not quite right about it, then the rest of the building will be off, won't it? It won't be in the right place. It won't be at the right angle. Things just won't fit, you know. You've probably tried to build things like that when you just got one wrong and the whole thing goes wrong. So yeah, we, that's what will happen if the first one's wrong, but. Thankfully, Jesus is perfect, isn't he? He's exactly right. He's in the right spot, exactly the right orientation. Then Paul goes on to say that the apostles and prophets are more of that foundation. So you can think of them as you know, lines either way. So I guess, yeah, that uh, they, they would sort of mark out the walls and, uh, and the size of the structure and, and all the reference, all in reference to the first perfect foundation stone, Jesus, right? So lined up with him. And just quietly, do you remember how many mistakes and stumbles the apostles made in their early days? <laughs> Before Jesus' resurrection especially. So there's hope for all of us, isn't there? If they're called someone we can align our lives according to, God worked in them so he can work in us as well. So there's always hope. So anyway, with the foundation of the structure of God's human building now established, that's in the past because that's established and we're being built on top of that. So we're further stones in that structure. And we've been lovingly shaped and placed as God designed us. Now I know Pink Floyd's song, you know, Brick in the Wall song, um, implies that being another brick in the wall makes us meaningless individuals. But since when do we get our theology from popular music, right? So he took it the wrong way. No, we are all unique blocks shaped just right, even if we can't tell how our shape fits with everyone else's shape sometimes. You know, it takes us, sometimes we never figure out how that fits, but God shaped us just how he wants us. So we've got to trust God, don't we? He knows what he's doing. Okay, so back to Colossians 2, verse 7 again. Keep your finger in, or marker in Ephesians 2, or we will be back. Colossians 2, verse 7. And I'll show you the whole verse this time. I'll bring that up there. So we've got good roots in Jesus like a healthy tree. And we also being built up by the master builder God. Okay, so there's two things there. So what else does Paul tell us about our foundation? He says that we are established in the faith. Now, scholars differ exactly on what faith there means. Is it that we are established, each person, with our own portion of faith? Well, there is some truth in that, even though it, it does sound a bit Calvinistic, which is the idea that faith is purely a gift, nothing to do with our own will. And I, I disagree with that. And, and it's... I, it's because I, don't, I just don't think it's very accurate. And I, hope you, I hope you can see that and I'll, I'll show you a bit. So to say faith is only a gift from, the, from outside ourselves and, and nothing else is more like the pagan view of faith that we talked about before, isn't it, where it gets like, poured into you? No, the ability to express faith, so that is the ability to have conviction about the reliability of something or someone, is inherent in our being by virtue of having free will which really is the gift. The free will is the gift, not the faith that comes from that. Having the free will means that you will put your faith in something. So the free will is the gift. Your faith is what do you want to do with that. So faith is not a substance which God downloads to us. 
But the verse that's often used to argue otherwise is the one we've just seen already, so Ephesians 2.8. So if I may, can I just clarify this misunderstanding because it sends a lot of people off track and I want to save you the trouble of learning the hard way if, if I can. And this might sound a little bit tricky or complicated, but stay with me and I know you, know you can get this, right? So I've got lots of pictures to help you. So here it is, Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. All right? that's, that's the bit under, it's a lot of contention today, these, these days. So the misunderstanding comes about because people think this, the this, in the middle there, refers to the concept of faith. Because it's the most recently mentioned thing, so linguistically it's called the antecedent. Right? That's, that's what they're calling it. But the problem is that in Greek the genders of the word don't match. So did you know that there were different genders of words? Yeah, it's some in English as well. But um, So there are genders, and I'm here to tell you there are three. Now, don't freak out about that. <laughs> if this isn't Facebook. The genders are simply male, female, and neuter. Okay, so, so the male, female, or neither. And it, like, like we said, it does happen in English too. So we, for instance, we have his, which is male, hers, female, and what's the other one? No, theirs can be either or, but no, it's, it's keeping in the same, his, hers, it's, that's keeping them all together. His, hers, and it's, so it's is neuter. So in Greek, the words that are specifically connected have to be the same gender. Okay, that's how they worked. English is a little bit different, but, but it's very, Greek is very strong like that. So in this sentence, the word this is a neuter, green. So I've got green there. But the word faith is feminine. So I've got it pink there. Um, so sorry if the stereotype offends you, but it just conveys the idea the best way, using pink. So what does the unmatched gender thing tell you? Well, it tells you that this doesn't directly connect to the word faith. So that's why I put it across on there. This does not refer to faith. All right, so what does it refer to? It must refer to something. So is it grace? Well, no, grace is feminine. So it's not that. Is it saved? Well, no, that's masculine. All right, so it's none of those things. So what is it? Now, to cut a long story short, it's the whole concept. By grace you have been saved through faith. That's the this. Because a whole concept like that with mixed genders it therefore becomes a neuter. That's effectively that's how it is. So in other words, the whole idea of God rescuing us by his grace through our faith in him is his idea. And therefore this is the gift to the human race. That's what's in the box, if you want to look at it as a box. The whole idea of being saved through those means. So does that make sense? I hope it does. So that's the misunderstanding. Is a, is faith, they say faith is a gift like it gets pumped into your body. But <laughs> it's not like that. So practically that means God, by his incredibly generous grace, became a man and died in our place. So that, you know, I find myself going into John 3.16 now. <laughs> Whoever believes in him, believes is the same word as faith, shall not perish but have eternal life. All right? Okay, so back to Colossians 2 verse 7 again. If that's not the right way to understand the faith that is, that is put, put into us, that, that is a gift deposited in our hearts, then what is the right way? Well, I would argue that because of the the, and of the context is talking about the body of truth of the gospel, the faith. So it's all that stuff to do with the gospel which, looking back, matches in with the idea of Christ Jesus being received, doesn't it, back in verse 6, because you receive this thing. Which is not faith as such, but you receive the gospel, don't you? You receive the message that you, you hear it and you receive it. Which carries with it the idea of being carefully passed down as it's received. So the, the particular word received there, there's a few different words for received, but this one is one that implies that it's been you know, handed over, entrusted to you, and you've taken it. And, and you're using it. So it matches with that context, and also looking forward, it matches with the idea of as you were taught, right? Which comes immediately after. The faith, you were taught the faith. So what Paul is saying here 
is that the entirety of their salvation, their relationship with Jesus Christ, is based on the eternal truth of the gospel. It can never be shaken. So what does that mean for us practically then? Well, it means those of us who are more mature must, and I mean must, for the health of the church, take the time to pass down the truth of Jesus carefully and deliberately. I'm not talking just about Sunday school, I'm talking about broadly, any time you get a chance. And even organising a time to do it, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing we, we need to be seeing that. So we must not neglect this super important task of passing it down, because that's the picture in Paul's mind here, of the truth of the gospel flowing down the generations, bringing life and love all the way down. Now the question is, are you doing your part in that process? especially those of you who have been believers for many years, if someone who doesn't know you analysed your life, would they conclude that this is a priority for you? What, what would they think your priorities are? Now, I know we're not all evangelists, but, but if we know Jesus, shouldn't we be naturally be dead keen to help our fellow brothers and sisters know him better? Because if we do that, if we pass it down like that, if we are, then we are revelling in the incredible truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that leads to joy and thanksgiving which is what the last phrase in verse 7 they're talking about. Now, unfortunately, the ESV translation doesn't bring that out very well, but the phrase speaking about the faith is literally this, overflowing in her in thanksgiving. Remembering faith is what? Feminine. Feminine. So that's why it's a her there. So it's specifically pointing to the faith. That, that is pointing to the faith specifically because of the her. So that's the link you're looking for. So we're you know, overflowing in the faith in thanksgiving. That's the idea. So as you can see, wow, it's pretty packed, this verse, isn't it? Verse 7, there's lots in there. So I hope we can all prayerfully consider the truth and challenges in there. So, Okay, now Paul has established the reason why our walk should be faithful because the foundation is super strong, Jesus. So he starts in verse 8 to address the challenges to their personal firmness. And the challenge is, or the threat is, the false teachers. So they'd come in and were questioning the reality of Jesus' deity, even his physical reality, some of them. They said he was just like a phantom. And these are some of the basic ideas of a heresy called Gnosticism, which is still around today, actually. I remember a few years ago I talked to this guy and after a few minutes of talking to him, I realized, you're Gnostic. <laughs> he had all these things, he had them all. The way he was t- talking about Jesus and he didn't like, knowledge, didn't like um, that kind of knowledge anyway. Didn't like the idea that we don't know. That's the idea. So, yeah. Because he's a Gnostic, because he, he does know, he thinks. So. Um, but to question the reality of Jesus' physicality is to question the reality of his death, isn't it? Because if he's not real... He didn't die. And the question of the reality of his death is to question the possibility of our salvation. So it's pretty serious, isn't it? If Jesus wasn't real. Because if Jesus didn't have a real body and he didn't really die on the cross, a real cross, and really rise from the dead, then we as real humans can't be saved. That's basically what it boils down to. It's only someone like us who can save us. So I probably phrased that incorrectly as I said it. It's probably only someone like us who can save us. <laughs> In other words, Jesus. As Hebrews 2.17 says pretty clearly, you don't have to look this up, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So a phantom ghostly Jesus just wouldn't cut it because he wouldn't be like us, would he? Because we, you know, we're solid. So since this is a challenge to both the identity of Jesus and the genuineness of salvation, which are the two qualities of heresy, right? If they challenge the the identity of God or they damage salvation, that's a heresy. So Paul had to hit it head on. So Colossians 2 verse 8 back in there. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So how can something that's empty take you captive? 
Well, let's think of some examples. What about living your life to climb the corporate ladder? Spiritually, that's empty. There's no credit in heaven directly for being a CEO of anything. Not that it's bad, but if that's the end in itself, then it is bad. If that's all you're trying to do is get the credit of being a CEO or whatever. And it can take you captive, can't it? If, if, if you, be, you, can, you can become a slave to that. Your family can suffer, your health can suffer, and more importantly, your spiritual health can suffer if you make the wrong thing the wrong thing, or the, wrong, the, the main thing. What about another example, maybe just pampering yourself? More comforts, more things, more indulgences, more holidays, whatever. Again, none of these things are bad in themselves, but if all you're doing is indulging your own pleasures, then it is. It, it, it's empty. And again, it can, be, can certainly be slavery, slavery to your own appetites, slavery to the admiration of others, if that's how you're measuring your personal value. Okay, so what about what Paul is st- talking specifically about here in verse 8? So what, what is it he's talking about? Well, it's a belief system, specifically a belief system about God. And that's what the, the status climbing and the self-indulgence are. They're false belief systems. And they can be gods even, can't they? That's, you know, these things that we take a take us away from Jesus can be God, called gods. And I'm sure we can all very quickly think of examples of more belief systems and philosophies that bring slavery, right? I'm going to bring up a few pictures that might help you think of some. Let's go back to the Tower of Babel, that one. So yeah, there's a few there. So they can bring slavery. Now, now it's not just errant religions but also cult-like systems of thought, like much of what we see in the media and governments today, if I'm being honest, because they can be cult-like because more and more they expect us to believe what they say unquestioningly, right? But I do think we should question them sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah, Got to look at what's, what, what's the reason they're saying what they're saying. So, so what Paul's saying about those kind of things, what, what, what is he saying? Basically, well, check them out. But if you know that they're clearly false, then don't believe them. Believe Jesus instead. But it's a bit deeper even than what you may be thinking there because belief in Jesus goes right to the fundamentals of our understanding of who we are, how we got here, why we're here, and most fundamentally of all, who is God? These are the, the deepest things, right? Who is God? If everything comes out of who is God. I'd love to do a study on that one day, how misunderstanding of God creates errors in all other different ways so I'll look into that one day but this is the level of comparison being drawn up here and the phrase elemental spirits of the world perhaps can be a touch misleading so the word spirits is not actually there in the original Greek not that it's way off but um, it's just it's I think it's emphasizing something different to what Paul is emphasizing here because the word he uses is stoicheia and if you think back to chemistry class, you may have heard a word like that. I'm trying to see if there's any... F- yeah, there's a few nods. Stoichiometry, you ever heard of that? No? If you've done chemistry, you would have. Like chemistry, probably upper school. That's, it's the science of chemical reactions. So where you're focusing on the building blocks of all matter, the molecules and atoms and the elements and how they all react. So, so that's what's coming for you here, Sam. And is he? Okay. <laughs> If you do, if you do chemistry, no, yeah, well, keep an eye out for it. So, yeah. So anyway, that's how how it got its name, stoichiometry, um, the idea of working with the building blocks, the fundamental elements of matter, because that's the idea of the word stoichia. It's about building blocks. So I'm going to use that as building blocks, right? So Paul is literally talking about the building blocks of the world, but in the sense of the belief system, right? So, because that's the context he's in, right? Belief systems. He's been talking about belief systems clashing here. Because he was just talking about the faith, the belief system of the gospel, and now he's turning to the opposite side, the belief system of the world and human tradition and all that. So what he's basically saying is, which worldview are you basing your life on? Is it the worldview based on Christ? 
that he created everything and when we fell, he launched a rescue mission by becoming a man who then died in our place and rose again to bring eternal life and he's coming back to bring the kingdom one day. That's the gospel worldview, right, in a nutshell. But the worldview of the world is very different and of course there are many varieties today as we saw before in that that thing brought up. Um, Satan doesn't really care which one of those things you believe so long as it's not the true one, right? He can take you any direction you like, you'll go. But to generalise the world's building blocks or the world's basic assumptions are that we can save ourselves. We can be as gods, to quote the fundamental lie from Satan's own mouth in the Garden of Eden. That's, what, that's a, you know, the first one and that's still going today. He hasn't changed his tune. Just He might just change a few harmonics in the tune, but not the harmonies. Uh, and coupled with these kinds of worldviews is the denigration of God, especially telling lies about the person and work of Jesus Christ. So he's what it's all about. Once you get down to brass tacks, it's, it's Jesus. And the world's assumptions, though, will bring you into slavery to something or someone eventually. But the gospel worldview will bring you into freedom. Even now, but especially in the end, right? So that's why we need to keep Jesus utterly central to everything we do in church life. Because do you want to be free? Yes, you don't want to be slaves. Well, if you've trusted your life to Jesus, you already have it. You have that freedom. It might take a while for that to begin to, you know, to work itself out in your life. Because you've got, we have to unlearn a few things and change a few of those ruts that we're in and get into new, new ones. <laughs> kind of. Um, so it takes a while, but positionally we are no longer under the yoke of sin and death and all that stuff on our list there. We have eternal life and that's the incredible truth of this whole Easter time, isn't it? That, that ended with the resurrection of Jesus. Well, you know, that, that period of time ended with that, but it's not the end at all, it's just the beginning. And it's great to know that's, that's the beginning of all that wonderful, wonderful what's coming. But the world and the spirits of evil in this world are whispering in our ears things that are contrary to this freedom and this life that we have here. So when the ESV puts the words spirits in verse 8, it's not entirely out of place, I don't think, but in, in fact it can point us to another place Paul talks about this kind of thing, and that's Galatians 4, verses 8 and 9, and we'll finish by looking at this real quick. Now the Galatians were a bit like the Colossians in that they were being sucked into false teachings, although the Galatian false teaching was more along the lines of legalism and trying to make you do things to, to, as, as means for salvation rather than only faith in Christ. And so Paul had to deal with that, with the Galatians there, because it was slavery again, right? It made you have to do this and do that and get circumcised and blah, blah, blah. So you see, all false belief systems take you captive. And so as we, as we close here, I just want to read to you Galatians 4, verses 8 and 9, and you'll be able to see the parallels with what we've been saying, hopefully. So I'll encourage you to dig around there and see more of what God has to say on these false elementary principles, false worldviews uh, that are always trying to come into the church. Galatians 4, verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. They're speaking of those spirits teaching lies. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles? So there's that stoic here again, those building blocks, empty building blocks of the world, so yeah, of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more. So they were turning back to the to works, so they're, they're empty worldviews. So to quickly summarise what we've seen today, let's not be slaves. Let's follow Jesus because they're the only cho two choices you have in the end, to be a slave or follow Jesus. And we are slaves to Christ in a sense, but it's a freedom, right? So, so I pray we all choose Jesus, obviously, and, and, by, and, and set our fa faith foundation on him and on his teaching. Then we won't be captive and we'll grow up together as God builds us and we'll have that joy in him and we'll be full of thanks and be able to rebut those lies of Satan because we know the truth, right? The truth will set you free. So and we'll, we'll be truly alive in Christ. So that's what we want to be. So let's pray. Well, Lord our God, we thank you just so much for 
giving us this gospel and sending Jesus, your son, as we, we focus especially on him at this time now. We just thank you, Lord, for what it means. There's just so many dynamics to it and so many angles to it, Lord, that we can't comprehend. But thank you that the more we do, the more we're lifted up, the more we're freed, and the more we will be inspired to talk, tell others about you as well. So we thank you for this message for us today and pray as we continue through this series for the next two weeks that we'll really have our eyes open to more of who you are. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.